Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive a sinful man. Make him a message clear and plain. Christ receive a sinful man. Amen. Faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I already say the safest of uh, chief of sinner. What is your problem for not getting saved, man? Hosea chapter 5, please. Whenever I say we're going to try and finish the chapter, it doesn't go that well, so I'm not going to say it, but I'm thinking it. Be like Kent Copeland, man. I'm going to speak it into existence, brother. Yeah. COVID devil be gone. Yeah. Whatever foolishness he did a few years ago, man. I was thinking green eyed devil himself, man. What's that? He away. Yeah, he said, <laughs> the best is seeing Benny Hinn take his coat off and wave it and just banks of people go down like a reverse wave. You know how back in the 80s, oh, you guys weren't even alive in the Bible, you probably know, the wave and, you know, baseball stadiums and football stadiums, everybody stand up and, you know. It was in the 90s. Benny, was in the 90s? You were alive in the 90s, man? You did the wave? Wow, interesting. Wow, man. So Benny Hinn has the opposite effect, man. He waves the jack and everybody goes down, man. Yeah, if that's of God, I'm the Pope. Let's read, let's read verse number 8 and verse number 14 of Hosea 5, and then we'll get into it tonight. Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Aven after thee, O Benjamin. Verse 14. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away, and none shall rescue him. Thank you again, Father, for the night. Thank you through the sadness and the heaviness of Hosea there is still a Redeemer in Israel. It's the God of glory. And Father, if they had just turned, how much better would it have been? But Father, through your providence, your foreknowledge, and everything that you saw from the beginning to the end, you saw man's heart, as we heard this morning in Sunday school, it's deceitful above all things, and the decisions and the choices men make. And Father, none of it upsets your word or your plan. Thank you that you will be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your king will sit upon your throne. And Father, he will be the king of kings and lord of lords. And I thank you for that. Thank you for the infallibility and the, just the sure pureness of this book, this King James Bible. I ask your blessing, Father, through the power of the Holy Ghost tonight upon the teaching and preaching of this word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Weird thing here. The Bible says in verse number 8, Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah, Cry aloud of Beth Aven after thee, O Benjamin. And then he says in verse 14, I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. So what's happening here is you would think, oh, wow, well, this, this sounds like a good thing. And we actually looked at Psalm 81 last week where blowing the trumpet is part of the Sabbath and part of the feast days and all these things that God had ordained in Jacob. That's the quote from Psalm 81. But this is not a good thing. This is not a positive part of Hosea, not that it's all been roses and lilacs and whatsoever up to this point, it's still going to be very negative because there's no repentance here. Uh, the, the men of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and the two southern ones are now joined the fray. They're loving all the idols that they can possibly imagine, ones they can make with their hands, ones that enter into their mind, the whole nine. And God says, I've given you chance after chance. I'm now sending you a, a prophet who is a, is a living flannel graph, a living Sunday school lesson for you to understand my relationship with you. He's married a harlot, and then he went and married another wife. He's had kids. And it's, Hosea has been an unbelievable prophet to these people. And now God says, you know what? Uh, blow, blow you the trumpet. And they're probably thinking, oh, this, finally, we're going to get deliverance from all this. And finally, we're going to be back on top. And God's like, no, this blowing of the trumpet is for me to assemble you so I can destroy you. Did you read that in verse 14? Do you know why he wants to get them together? So he can tear them in pieces, man. This is not a good assembly. I'm looking forward to the Trump of God. The last, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day Donald Trump gets back in office and the rapture happens. No, I'm looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ comes in the cloud. Now, I'm going to say a couple 30-second little snippet on that. 
the saved people seven, eight years ago who thought Donald Trump was ushering in the rapture. And then when he made Jerusalem the capital, oh, 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 oh look at it. Oh, ah! yeah. yep. I, I don't even have, I don't have any godly words for those people. And they're my brethren in Christ. Yeah. I'd rather talk to lost people that have nothing but the world on their side than to a saved person who's trusting in politics. But anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to the last Trump, man. You know, the first Trump for the assembly and, the, and then the second Trump to get up out of here, the dead in Christ rise first, that would be the first blast. The last blast is, we were to live remain, let's get out of here. That, I'm looking forward to that trauma, but this one, oh man, this is not a good one. And the, it's, it's interesting how the Lord says, I'm going to be a lion to them. Now, I think you know where we're going for a little few minutes here. Let's do this. Let's go to Hosea 13. Hosea 13. I just don't understand the political thing. I really don't, man. Do you understand if you went to China and tried to preach politics? How about the Bill of Rights in China? How about the, uh, uh, I, I, ha I, ha I have my freedoms. I have the First Amendment in China. Imagine preaching that, that from America over there. Uh, as Dr. Peacock likes to say, and it's a profound statement, if you can't preach it in another country, don't preach it here. Yeah. That he's not talking about culture where you may have to wear a different uh, 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 dress because, you know, the Mormons wear suits over there. Or, or We're not talking about culture. He's saying don't bring your American identity and think that's what you're resting on as a child of God and try to bring that out to the world. I am to preach the gospel, the grace of God to the lost people. Yeah. I'm to help save people grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are not ushering in an earthly kingdom. We don't use any of that money that's given for ushering in anything earthly. Nothing. I just want you guys to know that in case you're wondering, man. There won't be any voting booths here or any of that other foolishness and getting involved in you know, the, the stuff of the world. When Jesus Christ was brought a penny, what did they say to him? And he goes, well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unto God which are God's, man. Keep them separate. Pay your taxes, pay your bills, but you better take care of God first and foremost, man, with that whole thing. And understand what belongs to God belongs to God and what Caesar has of this world. And it, the, the, the two are not supposed to mix whatsoever. Uh, Hosea 13, 5 through 8. Uh, Frank, why don't you get, you know what, now, you know what, let's go Justin, 5 through 8. Get Justin, get this crowd over here on the left going tonight, man. I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. According to their pasture, so were they filled, they were filled, and their heart was exalted. Yep. Therefore have they forgotten me. Mm -hmm. Therefore I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard by the way, will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps, and will rend the gall, the gall of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion, the wild beasts shall tear them. <laughs> oh, that's a horrible thing. A horrible thing. You don't want the God of glory to be your enemy. There is nothing you can do against him. The app, there's, no, there's no way to fight against him. He would be like the proverbial big brother just holding his hand out and keeping you while you're swinging like a madman. You're like two years old and he's like 20. You, Paul, you know what happens on the street when you mouth off and they hold you at bay, man. <laughs> you're just swinging, you're slashing like Benny and you're biting your lip because you're angry and all that stuff. No, man, that's what you, you don't go against God. And you know what he's going he's gonna to do to these people? He's going to rip him in shreds. Now, he say, you, you have to take this, yes, historically. You can look at what happened when they said we have no king, but, but Caesar and, and our, uh, his blood be on us and our children and the Holocaust and all that stuff. But you've got to remember, what's the first thing Scripture is given for? Doctrine. So where would this take you doctrinally? What period of time? Church age? Tribulation period. I'm going to show you something neat. Go to... Go to Revelation chapter 13. This is, a, this is a sidebar. I was reading this afternoon and it kind of struck me as being okay. Kenny, this is a little extra for you. 13, 1 and 2, please, if you could, to Revelation. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise sorry, up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Mm -hmm. 
and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as a mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. What are the animals named over in Hosea that God says he's going to be to them? A lion, a leopard, and a bear. Who's God going to bring that forward to, to Israel? Through the Antichrist, because you didn't want his Christ. So you see the prophetic nature and the doctrinal nature of this is that, yes, Hosea historically happened, without a question. But you've got to take it from a doctrinal prophetic viewpoint that out into the future, the tribulation period, this stuff's going to get really wrenched down, man. It's going to be out of control. I don't care what goes on. I won't be here. I have my own appointment, as do you if you're saved. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. So that, that's, that, that might be the tribulation period for some of us. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't last very long. But while we're up there in glory, the body of Christ, all this stuff's going to go wild down here. I do believe it is seven years, not three and a half now. Could have been three and a half back if they had taken Jesus Christ as their king in Acts 7. Yes. But now they sat back down and the blindness to the, um, the Israel has happened in, Revel in Romans chapter number 11. No, it's gonna, I believe it's a full week, which a week is seven years according to the way that Jacob served for Rachel. In fact, he did it twice. And according to over in Daniel chapter number 9. So a week is seven years. And this, when this happens, it's going to be horrible. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, look what the Bible says with me over in Jeremiah chapter number 5. Jeremiah 5. So the Lord's going to be a lion. He's going to tear him up, man. A lion's quite an amazing animal, man. Those things from a standstill can can leap an, un, an ungodly amount of feet in the air. They'll sneak around. They'll pounce on you, man. They'll distract you and then just get you. And before you know it, you're in the bush getting torn up, man. Think about that animal and think about what the Lord's going to do. It is not a pleasant thing to stray from our God. Now, I know the mercy and grace of God. I know I'm in Christ Jesus. I know I'm eternally secure. But why would I play that against Him? Why would I use that as a credit card against my Savior when he's been so good to me. And that's the mentality of most of God's children. Now we're taking a New Testament view of it as a child of God, is that we play God like he's just a genie, and, well, I'll just go back to him and get forgiveness. I know I, know I can do that. I, can, I know I can restore fellowship. I don't have to get saved again, none of that. I know I have to restore fellowship with him. But why would I treat him like that? And there does come a point in your life where God says, that's enough, rot off the top of the fridge. Now we're going out behind the woodshed. And it's because I love you. I don't know what chastisement is for you. I don't know if it's financial, emotional. I, I don't know what it, for me, it's physical. There's no question about it, man. Take, it ain't that funny, Frank. I mean, seriously, man. But, I mean, that, but not everything that happens to me physically is, I'm just getting older, man. I mean, but not everything that happens to me is God's judgment. So if you see me coming here limping, it's not because God hates me one day. But I wouldn't be so stupid not to ask him if it was. The first thing that happens is, Lord, is this from you? Or did you send the devil after me? Or is this just time and chance? Or am I just reaping what I sowed? Those are good questions to ask, man. Look what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 5. Estiana, uh, get 1 through 6. Kenny, don't worry, I'll get you back, kid. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And though they say, the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. Wow. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Mm. Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their cases harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Wow. Therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are fools, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I will get them up, but I will get them upon the great men, and will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bond. Therefore, a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch Look over at that. the city. Every one that goeth out thence will be torn in pieces. Because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased. A lion, a wolf, and a leopard. 
Uh, what does a hireling do when the flock's in danger? What kind of animal comes after the flock? And what's the hireling do? Runs away. That wolf is something else, man. Comes a, a ravenous wolf, comes in to tear everything up and to destroy. That's the picture God's given to these, and now, and now it includes Judah. And only by the mercies of God, they're not wiped out. You, you think about the promise God gave. Go to Jeremiah 50 while I'm blurby laden. Go to Jeremiah 50. You think about the land track that God originally promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and look at the size of it now. Now, it's going to go back to the real deal. There's no question about it. But you think of what's happened to Israel. You think of the population they had. I was just reading over in uh, the Old Testament this afternoon and going through some stuff. They had a million just in Israel and another 400,000 in Judah around the time of the kings and 100,000 of, of the guys from the million were just armed soldiers, just 100,000. It's like 1.5 million just you know, counting up in that little area. And, and now, what is it? I don't even know what the population of Israel is now. Point being is that they've been thinned out, they've been attacked, assaulted, hunted, killed, gassed, famine, torture, and they're still here. They're going to get down to a remnant in the tribulation period, and then their king comes and sets them up in the kingdom. And they'll be, they'll be the head of the dog and not the tail. But not now in Hosea. And like I said, you've got to keep the prophetic eye going forward into the future in the tribulation period. Um, Paul, he gets 17 to 20. The lions, plural. The lions have there you go. Away. First, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Oh, that's Nebuchadnezzar, buddy. You got to read careful. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, every, every once in a while, God throws in a Nebuchadnezzar just to see if you're you know, paying attention, if you're not yep. sleeping. <laughs> Haley just gave a thumbs down to somebody. Did you give a thumbs down to Polly? No. That's bad. You're hoping, you're hoping a she-bear comes out of the wood at Haley right now, huh? <laughs> Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar. Don't ask me why the R to the N and the N to the R. I don't know why. I really don't. But anyway, go ahead. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king, the king of Babylon, in his land, as I have punished the king of Assyria. And I will bring Israel again to his habitation. Mm -hmm. And he shall feed on and his soul shall be satisfied, satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Gilead. I'd rather feed on chocolate. I don't like to feed on caramel. It's just not my favorite. You know what I'm saying? With chocolate, too. <laughs> Done together. In those days, <laughs> and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I deserve. When does Israel as a nation get their sins blotted out and taken care of? Second coming. Yeah. Acts 3.19, the times are refreshing. What did Jesus Christ say on the cross in Luke 23? Father, forgive them. Plurality. God holds the nation of Israel guilty for that, though Rome was the trigger man for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But I, again, if you're, if you're a Bible underliner, I would, I would, you can do whatever you want, man, but he just gave you two of the lions in verse number 17. And that's important. Assyrian and then Babylon. Now you say, what's the big deal about that? We're going to get to a verse tonight, Lord willing, where Israel goes to the king of Assyria for help. And God says... I just snared you because now the one you turn to for help is going to be a lion I use against you. It's creepy, man. Not ooky, it's creepy. Ezekiel 32. Ezekiel 32. Mo? Ezekiel 32. Ask now if you're, ask now if you're pondering for a question. Questions are Wednesday night, okay? <laughs> put, it, put it in the question box in the back, man. What's that? The who? That's right. That, that's right. Ask brother. Ask brother James. Ask brother James. He'll tell you. I've already warned him. Go ahead. 
One, uh, one and two, please. Ma, Lissa. Look at that. And thou art as whales in the seas. Are, are as a. Or as a whale in the seas. I know you think you're a sea world, but you're actually in Vernon. <laughs> and thou comest forth with thy rivers, and troublest the waters with thy feet, and thou dost there, There's so much in this Bible. He says that Pharaoh is a young lion. But what else did he sneak in there? He's a whale. That's the only God, uh, animal God specifically uh, calls out in Genesis. A whale is a type of Leviathan who's a type of the devil. And Pharaoh in this picture is a type of the Antichrist. So I had to ruin all your, your stuff, the animals at home, Frank, with your whales and all that stuff you got <laughs> hanging around, man. You know? But a, wha a whale to God, the way it's personified, it's not a, it's not a positive animal at all. Uh, interesting that a whale swallows a wooden boy who comes to life. And who is that wooden boy's guide? Go ahead, say it, John. I know you. What's his initials? Don't tell me this stuff is not from that King James Bible. Everything in one way, shape, or form comes from that King James Bible. There's nothing new under the sun. When man thinks they invent something, it's just further perversity that God covers somewhere in the pages of Romans 1 or Leviticus or somewhere else. You're not going to invent something that God goes, oh, whoa, whoa. did you see that? He's like, nah, it's just man going wicked. But that whale and that pharaoh, but he's also a young lion. What a crazy thing it is. Now, we know Jesus Christ is called what, according to Revelation 5, the what? It's the lion of the tribe of Judah, man. And now, actually, Judah is a lion's whelp over in, in Genesis 49, too. So, I mean, the point being is that God's going to let loose on Israel and Judah. And when he gets a hold of you, it's only the mercies of God they're not destroyed. Go with me, uh, Jeremiah 30. All right. Uh, I wanted to hit that briefly. That's just a little, that was a mini AP class. Go to a Jeremiah 30. Now, the Bible says in... Uh, there's a comment made in Hosea 5.9 about the day of rebuke. And I know rebuke is a good thing personally. In your own walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a stern correction. It's actually just like, hey, smarten up. It's, a, it's, it's pretty heavy, but there actually is a day of rebuke that's coming to that whole nation. Go to Jeremiah 30. I, I quoted it, but it's better for you to see it than for you to hear from my yap. So Jeremiah chapter 30. Mac, you there? Okay, can you get four through nine, please? And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and the concerning and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, ye have heard a voice of trembling and fear. And now I speak. Ask ye not ye whether a man who would prevail with a child with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hand on his loins as a woman in the church? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, Mac. Time out for. I'm not going to give you the. I could give you the picture, but come on, that is one of the most hilarious pictures ever. A guy was. He's like, no, no. This is. Just, I mean, it's basically. You know what? You know what this translates into from the Hebrew? Skinny jeans. Yes. This. This. You wear skinny jeans. That's you. You know what I'm talking about. You look like a, you got a, it looks like you got something, you got a, a bag of something in your pants, and you really you got little pipe cleaner legs, and you wear your little white sneakers with no socks or the little pads. What in the face of God's green earth are you doing? That's right there, man. I, I'm just telling you, it's in the Hebrew. You got to go study it out, man. But that's funny stuff, skinny jeans. What's wrong with you anyway? All right, I'm sorry about that. We, sorry, Mac, I didn't mean to bring you into my world. Go ahead. <laughs> there you go. Mm hmm Pretty cool. Time of Jacob's trouble, not the time of the church's trouble. The church is gone. The church is the body of Christ. 
I keep saying that in case you're seeing something on the internet that has maybe wooed you in the last several months. You are not going through the tribulation period, not for a second, not for a moment, not for anything. End of story. It's all throughout your Bible. Your Bible is a premillennial, pre-tribulational book. 100%. That's not the Baptist position. That's not the Ruckman position. That's not, it's the Bible position. That you as a child of God, a New Testament saint, washed in the blood, are not going through the tribulation period. COVID was not the tribulation period. The Great Depression was not the tribulation period. World War I, World War II, Korea, Iraq are not the tribulation period. The tribulation period is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel, according to Genesis 32, 28. I'm not going through it, man. Have fun. Have yourself a great time. Get your generator. Get your propane. Get your gas. Get your, uh, get your non-perishable rice and beans and everything and store it up. Do you realize how stupid Y2K was, man? Remember Y2K? You guys are, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. People scurrying around. We found a computer program. If you had a mortgage in, in 1970, when it turned zero, zero, no, it's because the computer, when they had, they had to manually put it in because the computer couldn't handle the number. But everybody freaked out and said Y2K was the end of it. Save people running around buying generators, making caves, and putting food on shelves. Thank God. Do you guys even know what I'm talking about? Thank God you're not. Am I the only one that has devils? Does anybody else have devils? I've had, saved, I've had saved devils around me forever, man. And they seem to like latch on to me, man, and say the stupidest stuff, even knowing the way I go at this Bible. You can just tell us it's just, it's, you know, uh, I, I don't know, man. I don't, it just freaks me out, man. But anyway, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Enough said about that. Go back, go back to a Psalm 37. Frank, can you get 10 through 20, please? Psalm 37, just looking at the day of rebuke real quick, how God is going to deal with the nation of Israel in total, the northern and the southern tribes, the whole, he's going to deal with them in the time called the day of rebuke, the tribulation period. Yes, sir, you got it. By the breath of God, frost is given. And did, I, did I give you the wrong reference, seriously? 37. Psalm 37? I knew you were. He's just letting you turn all kinds of red right now. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were Joe. I knew you were Joe with the frost and the frozen glass. I'm like, did you have a frozen glass before you came tonight? I'm just saying, just saying man. Go ahead, man. 10, 10 through twenty of Psalm thirty-seven, please. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. Mm -hmm. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, and have bent their bow, to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man yeah. is better than the riches of many wicked. Think about the tribulation period. When you're thinking about this, where being rich is going to be a problem. Being poor is no joke either, but being rich, not going to help you. And the key to this whole thing, Frank, and everybody else in verse number 10, is for yet a little while. He says that seven times in the book of the Gospel of John, 16, 16 on down. He says a little while, seven times, which is the tribulation period. Keep on going, Frank. I didn't mean to blow a circuit. Go ahead and finish up, man. For Here. the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. Very quickly, Zechariah eleven seventeen. What happens to the Antichrist? The arm of the wicked shall be broken. It's going to have a deadly wound, man. It's going to attack his his arm. Go, keep going. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of land. That's cool. They shall consume, and to smoke shall they consume away. Thank you. I just want to tell you, I wanted you to read all that just to get some practice in. But anyway, verse 19, it's called the evil time. It's the day of rebuke. God, God's bringing this time primarily against Israel. Does the whole world get affected? Sure does. 
But it's primarily as Hosea had to go marry a harlot and then marry another woman. God's trying to say, I've put you away, but I'm getting you back. But I'm getting you back through the worst time there's ever been on the face of this earth. I would to God you hadn't forced my hand in this, but you have. And now I've got to get you back through locusts and hailstones and famine and, and, and poverty. And I've got, to, I, I've got to chase you out to the wilderness and feed you out there like I did in the book of Exodus and, and numbers and all that. And now I have to repeat everything I did with you in Pharaoh's time because you just didn't learn. What a wild thing, man. It's a day of rebuke. It's that corrective in your face. It's meant to actually help you, but a lot of folks don't like to take a rebuke. Luke 21, please, Brother Bob, if you could. Luke 21. Give you one more on this, then we'll move on to the next verse. Luke 21, verses 20 to 24, if you could, Bob. When ye shall see Jerusalem coming with armies and know that the situation thereof is nigh, then let them which are in Judah Judea, flee to the mountains, and let them that are in the midst of, of it depart out, and let none of them that are in the country enter thereunto. For these are the days of vengeance. There you go. All things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days, for there shall be a great distress in the land and wrath upon the people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations. Look at this. Jerusalem shall be trodden. There you go. Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Thank you. You got your you got your concordance over to Revelation eleven, right? The temple which is given to the Gentiles and the court that's without, it'll be trodden underfoot for forty two months. Time, times, half a time, twelve hundred and sixty days. You just had, in those days, days of vengeance, that's the day of rebuke, man. It's God's final push and final assault on Israel like a lion. And he's going to use the Antichrist and the devil who's a roaring lion against his people to finally get them back. There's a lot in your Bible, man. It's awesome. It really is inexhaustible. I love it, man. All right, Deuteronomy 32, please. Deuteronomy 32. Let's do, uh, Jonathan, get Deuteronomy 32 if you could. The next thing he says over in Hosea 5, verse 10 is, you know what they did? They removed the bounds. Now, before, before Jonathan reads, because he's going to stand up, get all crazy. Blood's going to rush to his head. He just woke up. And so he's going he's to all freak out, man. The, what they did, what... What Israel did, and then Judah ended up doing it, says they removed the bound. Now, as a parent, you should set up boundaries for your children. You should set up boundaries for your employees if you're an employer. But what does mankind not like? Don't tell me what to do. Kenny, you work in a, you work, you work in a jail, man. There's some boundaries there. This is your free time. This is your lockdown time. This is your... Time you get drugs from me when I bring them into the, uh, into the room. <laughs> this is, I mean, there, it's a schedule, man. You have, listen, you have bounds. You have boundaries. You know what happened? The nation of Israel, they removed the bound. Uh, do you not see that in our country now where everything is on tap, man? They have found every way to commit sin, every way to defile themselves, Every way just to let it loose and they don't care about any recompense because there's no fear of God before their eyes, Romans 3. And you need boundaries. But the first thing you and I think of with boundaries is, oh, that's God shackling me in. He doesn't respect my freedom. He, doesn't, he wants to make me a robot. No, God's boundaries are set for a specific reason. Number one is protection. Because he knows what happens when you get outside the bounds. When you go back to Genesis, the reason why he said don't eat that tree, there was a reason for it. And look where we are today because they ate of it. So boundaries are good. Boundaries are necessary. But look at how God sets up some boundaries. And then you'll freak out with some things I have to say, but that's okay. We, 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 can, we can discuss that not later. 7 through 9, please. Brother Jonathan. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. 
the elders, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people <coughs> according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Okay, the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, that's not millions. How many tribes of Israel were there? How many natural bounds are there supposed to be on this earth the way that God divvied everything up according to what you just read? You can read Dr. Rockman's note and make sure I'm right. No, I'm just messing with you. You're in a hard time, man. He's, God, you just read it. God set up boundaries for peoples and nations. Now, here we go. We're just going to try, just might as well drive it right off the cliff. The big thing that happened in our country many, many years ago was integration. Oh, here he goes. He thinks he's going to be a racist now. Oh, shut up, man. I've witnessed more black people than you ever will. Hispanics, Chinese. I, I don't even care what you have to say about that. God set boundaries to get the gospel to specific types of people. And then when you... Oh, okay, you're looking at me like I'm all crazy right now. What happened when everybody got together in Genesis 10? What happens when any people get together and say, your idea is great. Oh, look at that. And let's collaborate and everything. No. It's not a positive thing when sinful men get together to discuss sinful ideas and inventions. God set boundaries. Those bounds are naturally set on your map. Oh, how does God get the gospel to them? Oh, I don't know. Puts people in the boat. Sends them from England over here with a King James Bible. Sends people up to Canada and Mexico and everywhere else. I understand we give the gospel to everybody. No problem with it whatsoever. I'm saying when you break the natural boundaries and the natural way God has set things up, nothing good comes from it. What do you have down in New York City? What's that place called that everybody gets together? The United what? Do you know what their motto is? Swords and, you know, into plowshares, you know, and, you know, you know, brotherhood of God, a fa a fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, unity of people. Anybody ever read a Bible before? God will get you, and God will give you His message on your continent, to your people, to whatever, if you are truly seeking it. Cornelius, all the churches in Zambia with John, Sarah, and whoever else was over there, people in the furthest... Get, come on, man, how do you explain that? It's when, the, when people start breaking the boundaries God has set up, it ha, it's nothing but trouble, man. That's not racist. That's biblical. I don't care what color your skin is when you come to this church. No concern whatsoever. But if you think black people and white people are the same, there's something wrong with you. If you think Shem and Japheth get along and that's just all the same, they're not even close. Culturally, food, everything. I can say I've lost you right now. You think I'm going crazy, man. No, just think about it for a minute. Take off everything you hear and your CNN and your Fox News and everything else and let's all get together and everything. No, God set bounds on this earth for peoples. Okay, maybe you don't believe me. Let's go to Acts 17. We give the gospel to everybody, man. The gospel tracts are going to go out. They're not just going to white people on Friday. They're going to everybody. I talk to everybody, every skin color. Don't care if you're a sodomite. you got 50 tattoos. I don't care. You're going to get the gospel. But to argue with the way God set this thing up, you're not scriptural. And when you break any boundaries that God has set, you get into trouble. I, I, I know, it's just, you know, it's all the Bible. It's not the Bible that I, you know, it's, it's the Bible. That's not the Bible I like. I, like. I just like my passages. You've got to take it all. And this is what starts separating people from other folks, man. <laughs> is when you start saying, well, this is what the Bible says, man. Well, I just think, I don't care what you think, and you don't care what I think. I want to go to the Word of God and find out what He has to say. So He set the bounds of this earth by the sons of Adam, according to the nation of Israel, or the people of Israel. Now, look at this one in 22. Uh, Jennifer, Acts 22. Uh, I'm sorry, 17, 22 to 31. Acts 17, 22 to 31. Therefore, you enter in worship, and declare I unto you. God that made the 
world and all things are in, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, which dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Look at this. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds that have to <laughs> that they should seek the Lord and happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our, your own poets have said, we are all of his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or mm-hmm. gold. There you go. Thank you. The Bible says in verse number two, he made, he made, uh, hath made of one blood all nations of the earth. That is not where all the children of God. We are the offspring of God in verse 28 and 29. But did you see in verse 26 at the end, what did God do with those men of one blood? He did what? He set up the what? The bounds of their habitation. So I just, I just make this up because I want to say stuff controversial. No, your Bible says that men ought to stay in their place and seek after God, and God will get you somebody. You know what's really crazy to me? I'll, I'll tell you just a, a, a wild one. Remember, remember with Jonah, where was he called to go preach? It's Nineveh, right? Where did he end up going? Remember, he took his tar. But where did he end up going? To Joppa, right? Was he supposed to go to Joppa? Where was he supposed to go? Nineveh. He's supposed to go preach to Nineveh. You say, well, isn't anywhere good to go? Should I just go anywhere? Okay. With the Lord's guidance. Now, you're going to think this is wild, but that's okay. You already think I'm that way anyway. He goes to Joppa. When he's not supposed to, he's supposed to go to Nineveh. The Lord says, yeah, okay, because you went to Joppa, I'm going to put you in a boat wreck, and you're going to get, you're going to be the original Jiminy Cricket and Geppetto and Clown Face Pinocchio. Do you know of an apostle who went to Joppa in the New Testament? Peter, to deal with Cornelius? You say you're stupid. Oh, I already knew that. God's timing for God's people in Joppa was Peter. God's timing for the people God called them to for Nineveh was Jonah. Jonah, I don't want you to Joppa now. They have their own gig. I will deal with them when the time comes when I deal with them. You go to where I tell you to go. I'm going to give you one more then because I can see the, I can see the doe-eyed look. It's either because you want to go back to sleep or you're just kind of entranced right now. I have that effect on people. Isaiah chapter number 5. I'll show you something neat. Isaiah 5. Taylor, Isaiah 5, and then we'll we'll go to... God has set this earth up in such a way that there are bounds, natural bounds made. It's the way way he set it up, man. 8, 9, and 10 of Isaiah, please, Taylor. Isaiah 5, 8, 9, and 10. <laughs> How long did you guys look for a house? Didn't you have something in mind when it came to land? Did you want to be around people? Well, just being honest about it, man. I'm not the most gregarious person myself, man. Well, God just told you that. Woe unto them that join house to house and that lay field to field. Spread out, man. Go to your place. Stay in your area. Stay in your lane, man. There's certain parts of the Bible just not real fun to read, are they? Jonathan, how many acres would you like in an ideal world? 10,000. 10, all, 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 all. Me too, man. We could go shoot and do whatever we want. But see, you don't understand something, man. God, God set this thing up a, a specific way. You know what man does? Oh, let's just build, a, let's build 15 houses in a cul-de-sac. 
and I have 0. .0003 acres of land. You know what I'm talking about, man, house upon house. They're putting houses where, you didn't, they're for years in Ellington because of the, uh, the uh, what, do, what do they call that, the, uh, the, the, the weirdo, uh, the weirdo, not the PETA people, the other freak shows there, the environmental weirdos there. Uh, the duck land and the water land and all that stuff and can't build here. We have a McDonald's in Ellington. A big Y. Oh, oh this, is, this is, we're the big city now, man. But you know what it is? It's just because people, you know, you know, just congregating and, you know, let's put up stuff to attract more people. God's like, no, stay out in the woods, man. <laughs> congregate when you have to. I'll get you something out there for you. I'll get you a church. I'll get you a preacher. Don't worry about it. But you start getting together and the intermingling and my idea and your idea and this religion and this God and this idol. And God says, what are you doing, man? Stay in your lane, man. Stay in your lane. I'll show you one final thing on this. Go to Acts 16. Sometimes, sometimes it's not good to go where you think you ought to go. You need to go where God tells you to go, just like with Jonah. Go to Acts 16. Acts 16. Haley, buddy, I need you to go. You know what? Go one through seven. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. Yes. That's what I get from getting lost. <laughs> <laughs> she gets that blame game from Karen, not from me, man. I take full responsibility for my actions. Yeah, yeah go ahead. What, Paul? <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's the name of our church, Phrygia. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. That's you supposed to preach the gospel everywhere to every creature. Not unless the Lord says, don't go there. I've got somebody else to go there. You go where I tell you to go. Aren't you glad that I bet, oh, excuse me, I'm glad Lydia, let me rephrase that. Lydia is probably glad that Paul listened to the Holy Ghost. She ends up getting saved. And that whole thing turns into the Philippian jailer where Paul and Silas sing praises tonight. What happens if he doesn't listen to the Holy Ghost? He says, I'm just going to do what I want to do and go preach where I want to preach. No, God will get the, yes, we're to preach the gospel and give the gospel to everybody we can. But some people, God just says, you know what? Let, leave that one alone. I'm not saying I'm there at that spiritual level of the Holy Ghost discernment. I'm just saying, you know what? Lord, would you direct me to the people you want me to talk to? Would you give me the open door and the utterance to speak to them? Would you give me, please, some confirmation from the Holy Ghost of God and the Word of God that you want me to speak to that person right now? And, and then you do it. The point of this whole thing is when you break down boundaries, you get out of God's boundaries. And now you start committing what's called trespass. Isn't, isn't a sign up there that says, don't go past this? Isn't a wire fence? Well, it's an invitation to actually go past the wire fence, especially if you have cutters with you. But I mean, and then you put it back and it doesn't look so bad. But I mean, when you, when you see the fences up there, that's a boundary. And then they put the orange sign up that says, no trespassing. Well, when you cross that, you are now doing what? You're now taking matters into your own hands, and you need to suffer the consequences if you get caught breaking the boundaries. Well, Israel, you broke my bounds. I gave you Ten Commandments. Was that so difficult to do? Gave you a priesthood. Was that so hard to follow? Gave you a sacrifice. I gave, I gave, you, I gave you saviors, small. I gave you prophets. I gave you everything you could, but you just couldn't stay, you couldn't stay in the lane. You had to go outside the boundaries. Because I'm, I'm just a rebel, man. I just want to do it my way. Well, you're stepping outside the bounds, man. Uh, come on, man. When you play, when you play football or uh, basketball, when that ball goes past that line, what do they call that? It's out of bounds. And it's called a turnover. You give possession to the other team.
So imagine every time you give the ball away and it goes out of bounds, how much power you give to your enemy. Because you just stepped outside the bounds. What's the big deal? I'm only a few feet on, the, on, on their land. What's the big deal? Might be a shotgun waiting for you. You have no idea, man, on this stuff. Well, God said, I set up bounds. I set the people here. I set this country here. I set this, this national, uh, the, the, this national uh, situation over here. I, I will handle it. Don't lay house upon house and field upon field and, and people. And just don't, don't, don't you guys remember Genesis 10? What's wrong with you? Okay, let's move on after that fun one. Go to Acts, go to Acts 5 oh, right here. Uh, actually, can you go back to Hosea 5 real quick? I want to read this and then we'll, we'll get scooting. Hosea 5. Go back to Hosea 5. I want to read this just to get a little bit of context and not just pluck it out and, and do something with it. Look at, look at 5. Look at 5.11 with me. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandment. Now, don't you think that would actually be a good thing to willingly walk after the commandment? If it's the commandment of God. So I'm going to throw this out to you as we're going through it because it's a Sunday night. We're going through this verse by verse. Is it okay for you to break the law? Is it okay for you and I to step over man's laws. Kenny said no. Depends on if they go against God's laws. I am to obey what Caesar says to do because God put him in control. Except for the mask thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's why the drapes went up. What? The, uh, the drapes went up and the frosted glass. <laughs> and everything else. But anyway, you, you are to obey... I'm to obey the tax laws. I don't like paying excise tax. I mean, it comes every July. They're still taxing me on a 16-year-old Honda and a 9-year-old Acura. And it's like, I don't know, what was it, like 600 bucks this year for two cars? I'm like, if you have a newer car, you must be getting absolutely hosed. Jonathan, yes or no? Or if you got a, you got a classic truck, like a 1920. So you get, Haley, you must have got crunched this year. Just for one vehicle. Just in tax. But what do you do? Not... I, I'm not paying that because, you know what, I'm a sovereign citizen. I don't drive a car, I'm traveling. Have you ever, ever you know what I'm talking about, when you, the sovereign stuff that goes on, how they say they're not a, a citizen of the United States, they're a sovereign citizen? Oh, good, you're so, it's, they argue with the cops and stuff about, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't in the car, I was just traveling. I just pulled you over, it's on, I was just traveling. And they actually go to car, court with this stuff. No, as much as I don't like it, you, if the policeman tells me to go to the corner and he doesn't tell me to stop preaching, I can go to the corner. I made a decision several years ago not to get the shot to go to jail. That was three, three years ago. That was just the decision I made. Looking back, maybe we should have taken it and still gone to jail, but then with timing and everything, it just probably wasn't the right move. At that, I, I don't know. But what I'm saying to you is that you have to, you can't just, some things are not just concrete black and white. You got to think them through a little bit. If you had the opportunity to take the shot, and it wasn't mandated, but to take the shot to go be a missionary, would you take the shot to serve Jesus Christ? The point being is that in this whole thing is that they, they willingly follow the commandment, but this was, this was the one time they should have said, we're not following that commandment to make false idols and bail and all this other stuff. I am to follow the law until they say, as Justin quoted, they say, don't obey God. That's the only time we are on just ground. If they say, stop preaching the Bible, that's hate speech and all that stuff, well, then we have to, we have to be prepared to go to jail, man. What happens if they came in here and said, we can't meet anymore? I mean, we live in the lap of luxury in America, where you can pretty much have a church anywhere you want, hand out tracts, wherever you I mean, honestly, if you can't witness for Christ and have a church in this country, something wrong with you, man. But what happens if they came in and said, yeah, you can't, we, don't, we don't like that Jesus thing. There's, uh, there's more than one God, and we don't want you near, and we love the rainbow and everything else. And what would you do? You know, we have the, the law says this. Well, what would you do? It is illegal in parts of Canada to say the word homosexual. So can you not say it? Well, we would just say sodomite. <laughs> Or, so, or any, any, anything what they determine as hate speech, there's going to probably kind of come a time where you can't preach certain sins out of the Bible, even though the Bible calls them sins, because they're hate speech. Well, what are you going to do? Not preach the Bible because it's hate speech? 
See, do you understand what I'm saying? They willingly followed after the commandment. That was the right time to say, that's the wrong commandment. We're not following that. We don't have to follow it because it's causing us to go against our God. Well, I, I don't, we, we've just had so much luxury in America, so much freedom. We don't know what it's like to actually have a gun-on-the-table moment where you have to make a decision. Uh, Karen, get X5. For the sake of time, can you do this? Can you read 29? Can you read 29 and then 41 and 42? 29, 30, and then go over to uh, uh, 29 and 41, 42 is good, Karen. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. I thought several verses before that they weren't allowed to say that name. What, weren't they? put under condemnation, under threat, that if you even say that name, we'll beat you again, we'll jail you again, you'll lose your liberties. And what do they say? You know what? We ought to obey God rather than men. That's the one time to stand up and say, you know, and you don't have to be a jerk about it. I need to obey my, my God. But just be prepared for the consequences. You might get locked up for it. You might have to go to jail for it. You don't have to be obnoxious about it and be a jerk about it. But... If they come up and say, you know, you're not preaching that name anymore. We hate that name. We hate that Bible. We don't, we don't want you mentioning that name again. You're going to have to make a call. What happens if your job says that to you? we got all kinds of wonderful things going through my company, man. The next wave that's due in the middle of September is our big ethics for the year. And I got a heads up from one of the guys because they know me. And they're like, oh, you're going to like this one. And it's all LGTPQ, Larry, Zonka, my, you know, Mike Ditka. <laughs> It's every, it's every, it's, it, and he said, oh, you're going to like this one, man. You know, uh, they're born that way, and we ought to need to respect them. This is on a, comp this is our ethics training for the year at a $23 billion a year company. So what happens if they ask me to put my name to it and says, do you agree to abide by this? You say that'll never happen. Oh, don't, don't think so, man. You, you, you need to be aware of it. I'm just saying, that was the one time they should have not <laughs> obeyed the commandment with the false gods and the idols and all that. They should have said, no, we're following our God. There's no, the first commandment is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and we're not following anybody else. That's the one time they should have said, we're not obeying you. Peter did. Turned out all right for him. Uh, we we, oh, we got to do this quick. Kenny, can we do this quick? Okay. Whoa. You're giving me five minutes? Well, so glad I'm under your authority. Here we go. Isaiah, Isaiah. <laughs> there you go, Estiana. Good job. Yep. You raised him from a pup, Estiana. <laughs> Isaiah 50, quick. Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50, come on. We'll, we'll get through this. Just give me a few more. I, re I really, I'm not trying to be like Pharaoh and not let the people go, but I, I want to get through the next couple verses quickly, so I'll, I'll pare it down here. He says, as a moth. <laughs> I hate moths, man. Those things come on our porch, man, something fierce. Just... <laughs> and you know when you cry... You know what I'm talking about. You, that's the same noise they make. That's on the camera. They're going to go like, he should, be, he should work for George Lucas. But yeah, they, you know, and they fly around. And then you crush them and they leave that brown dark spot. And then you try to rub it off, and it gets a little, and you're like, oh, this idiot. And it leaves a dust mark, like it's like from uh, Tutankhamun's uh, sarcophagus, man. <laughs> I hate those things. Mo moths are weird. But you know, what he, you know what he said he'd be doing? He'd be like a moth. I, it's just, it's a, what do moths typically do? What are they known for? They, they go after clothes. They tatter up clothes. I mean, they're, yeah, I mean, they look harmless. They pretty much are. Look at 50 of Isaiah. We back to you, Justin. Seven through nine. Give me a yeah, Justin, please. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I just need it. I needed it, man. I need <laughs> 50, uh, Isaiah 50, seven through nine, please. For the Isaiah. Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I shall know that I shall not be ashamed. Yeah, amen. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. 
who is mine adversary, let him come near to me. Look at this. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. <laughs> what are you told to do over in Matthew chapter 6 about your treasures? Where are you supposed to lay them up in store? Where what? Moth and rust doth not corrupt. The Lord's going to be like a moth to these people. A lion. A li you, you can't draw a better picture book than the King James Bible. Um, go to Job 13, quick. Job 13. Job 13. Can he get Job 13? Oh, man. Kenny, can you get 24 to 28, please? Wherefore, hidest thou thy face, and holdest me for thine enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf driven to and fro, and wilt thou pursue the dry stumble? For thou writest bitter things against me, and makest me possess the iniquities of my youth. Thou puttest my feet also in the stocks, and lookest narrowly unto all my path. Mm -hmm. Thou settest a point print upon mm. my upon the heels of my feet, and he a as a rotten thing consumeth as a garment that is moth. -eaten. That's the that's the judgment of Almighty God on that nation. Mm -hmm. Like a moth just destroys garments. What a crazy picture. Don't you love how, how great God is? In verse 27, he says, Thou settest a print. Upon the heels of my feet. You have footprints too, you know. And no fingerprints are ever the same. No snowflakes on it. Pretty neat, man. All right, let's go to this uh, Estion, 2 Kings. Second Kings, please. Do I have cinco minutos left, Kenny? Okay. Uh, Estion, I need you please to get 10 through 16 of 2 Kings 16. You, you, sounds like Scorby to me. <laughs> Til, uh, Tiglath Pileser, yes. King of Assyria. Oh. Saw an altar that was at Damascus. And, the king, and King Ahab said to Uriza, the priest, the priest who fashioned the mm -hmm. altar and the pattern of it according to the workmanship thereof. And unto Uriza, Uriza the priest, built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it against King Ahaz came from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it against King Ahaz came from Damascus. So very quickly before, I, and I, I understand we're stretched for time. Did you remember over in Hosea, they went to Ass Ephraim went to Assyria. Mm -hmm. what, what is Ahaz doing right here? He's building an altar after the altars of the Gentile gods in Damascus mm -hmm. and asking Uriah to build it after the pattern of those heathen reprobates. You went to you, Ephraim, you went to Assyria for help? Well, now I'm going to use them as lions to destroy you, like Nebuchadnezzar. Go ahead, please, Estian. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached to the altar and offered thereon. And he burnt his burnt offering and his meat offering, and poured his drink offering, and sprinkled the blood of his peace offering upon the altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before the Lord, from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord. And put it on the north side of the altar. Mm. And Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar burn the morning, the morning burnt offering, mm -hmm. and the evening meat offering, and the king's burnt sacrifice, and his meat offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, and their meat offering, and their drink offering, and sprinkle upon it all the blood of the burnt offering, and all the blood of the sacrifice. 
and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. <laughs> Thus did your the priest according to all that <laughs> This is not a good situation, man. You went to you went to Assyria, and now you get into ma- what are you doing going to consult other gods but me? And then you're going to set that up as an alt- as an altar to me? What? And you're a king. You're not a priest. What are you doing offering on there? We cannot do it for the sake of time. Go to, uh, go to Isaiah 18. Isaiah 18. So look at Shennacherib, the king of Assyria. He comes up and besieges Judah. Pick it up with me in verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Shennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me. For that which, uh, that which thou puttest on me will I bear. Oh, really, Hezekiah? You're speaking for the whole nation? You're going to take the burden of a, a Gentile, filthy, wicked king? Well... And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, look at this, and the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. He's taxing him. I'm I'm sorry, 2 Kings 18? No, if I didn't say it, that's my fault. Did I say Isaiah? Yeah, no, go ahead, man. No, I would... Yeah, that's a a, 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 a problem, man. I'm sorry. 2 Kings... That's it. 2 Kings 18, 13. See, Bob, I do make mistakes. I know you think I don't, but I do. Yeah, that's it. Uh, second, second Kings. I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm not, I make so many mistakes, I ain't funny, man. 2 second, Kings 18. Sorry about that. That's, that's horrible. If you want to look it up when you have a chance, the companion verse about the Assyrian and what he does is Isaiah 10. Pick up about 5 and go through 19. You'll, re- you'll read about the Assyrian and God's thoughts about that Assyrian. And why is Ephraim going to that? But then God's going to use them as a line to tear them up. Look at the Bible says to me. Now are you with me? Okay, 18, 18 13. You rebels in 13. <laughs> now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Shennacherib came of Assyria come up against all the fence cities of Judah and took, uh, fence cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah king of Judah sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish saying, I have offended, return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And, and, and so Hezekiah is actually giving in to this Gentile heathen king. And the king of Assyria, look at, he taxes him, appoint, appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30, uh, 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. That's what you think of me? You tear down my stuff, consecrated to me, and you give it to them? I will use them to rip you to pieces. God does not forget anything. Go with me to, I got, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, two more. I know I'm stuttering right now. Isaiah, Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55. So, Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, please. Kenny had Sunday school. I don't want to hear any more words out of you until, <laughs> until five weeks from now, okay, when you get back up here. But Jonathan's coming. No, nah, I got Jonathan coming up in September. He knows. <laughs> Amen. All right. I, w- I want to, he is special. Yes. Um, 55, 6, and 7 of Isaiah says this, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he abundantly pardon. I will, I'll close with that and the chapter because go to Hosea. We'll read the last verse and we're done. Hosea 5. Read the last verse. And I took you, I took you there for a reason. Go to Hosea 5 and we'll, we'll shut her down. 5.15 says this. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. You know what God just said? I'm going away and you won't find me until you repent. Now you say, what's the big deal about that? Uh, Aren't they in 
as I mentioned before, aren't they under the mystery of the temporary blindness of Israel right now? Isn't it difficult for them to get saved, even though they do and some have gotten saved? But one day they're going to actually see him face to face. And, but it's going to take that period of time, time of Jacob's trouble. It's, uh, it's rough, man. Real rough. Father, thank you for the night. Thank you for the opportunity to meet around your word. Thank you for being so good and kind to us. Please, Father, help us to apply, really, Father, these lessons from Hosea spiritually. But let us please, Father, not lose the doctrinal import that this is going to happen one day and to be thankful for the wonderful day and age we live in and the gospel we get to preach and the people we get to talk to about the Savior. Father, uh, please, would you bless the uh, going out of the incorruptible sea of the Word of God this Friday uh, through the tracks that will go out to East Windsor and South Windsor. May we see some souls saved or maybe some saved folks that, that, would, that would show up. Uh, Father, I, I know it's not about church. Father, it's, it's not. It's about your son and it's about their soul. But um, if we can be a help to them, Father, and if you can get the honor and glory from it, uh, I, I pray that you'd be pleased to, to do so. Thank you for the opportunities that will come our way this week. Help us to be attentive to as the Spirit of God leads us to who to talk to and who to not talk to. Thank you for this great Bible. Thank you for our great Savior. Father, please uh, bless uh, Brother Knox as he comes up to us. Please give him travel mercies and watch over him. May his journey be prosperous for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.